Please. Bob Holman, poet, proprietor of the Bowery Poetry Club, right. visiting professor at uh, NYU's Tisch School of the Arts and Columbia's Graduate School of the Arts. You're visiting professor. You're, you're adjunct, or you just you pop in. It's a visiting professorship. Somehow they've uh, acquired a new line for me. So cool. It's not a tenure track, but it pays better than being an adjunct. Almost anything does. That's <laughs> and it comes with that that beautiful title of visiting professor. I just dropped in. Teach one course a semester. One course at NYU in the fall, and one course at Columbia in the spring. Which uh, courses? Are they intro or are they advanced? No, they're both graduate courses. The one at Columbia is called Exploding Text, and that is a course in poetry performance. Um, it's the only uh, cross-genre course that the School of the Art offers, showing you exactly how conservative the Columbia Grad School is. But uh, students come, learn, they collaborate on projects with each other across disciplines using uh, texts, using as texts uh, poems, uh, uh, often poems by contemporary writers who are considered difficult, on the page, experimental type poets, showing, you know, the idea being that there's no such thing. As a, as a stage poem or a page poem, that um, all it needs is the imagination of the uh, visionary to work with the poet. Now that we have these things called cameras, these technological advances, the poets don't necessarily have to learn to use. That's somebody else's job, like yours. And uh, the course I'm teaching at NYU is called. Uh, art in the Public Sphere, and it's, of course, about the uh, utility of, uh, of cultural organizations on the Lower East Side from the 1860s to uh, 2060. So it's right in the midst of the transition. And we're having our performance over at the Bowery Poetry Club in two hours, and um, the club, of course, is in its own way a kind of anchor in the whirlwind of the current gentrification. Is it the final death knell to the transient neighborhood of the Lower East Side as everything becomes a theme park of itself, or are we simply watching another cycle? Luckily, my students have figured it all out, and we'll be performing it on stage today. Tell me what the answer what the answer is. At the end you of the got day. it. I, okay, I will. I'll call you. Up. <laughs> I think you'll have to have be there. You'll probably have a, other work to do. Yeah. How late do you think you guys are going to stay here? Any idea? Uh, I hope to be out by three thirty or four. Oh, beautiful. Okay. okay. Oh, sure. Um, how long have you been a poet or considered yourself a poet? In the third grade, I saw I was sick when they did poems, and uh, when I came back. They were up on the wall, and I was really uh, upset that they had started at such a juvenile level with the work. So I wrote my poem. Um, it must have been February flu season. I wrote my poem, The uh, George Washington Followed Indian Trails. Even then, I was a politically correct nine-year-old. Um, and took it up to the teacher, and she said, oh, Robert, this is such a lovely poem. Where did you copy it from? So I was hooked. So it's, I guess nine, since nine. And did you start reading very sophisticated poetry in a precocious time? Yes, I was a real reader. My mother was a uh, um, a great teacher, you know, and that mystery of uh, how one goes from the voice of your mother or you, you, whoever is your lullabyer. Um, into reading yourself, how you connect through the uh, the written word, through the printed word, is something that still is inspiring and uh, and mysterious to me. So I owe it all to mom. 
When did you jump from writing mostly? I mean, you're very performance oriented, so you don't always write for just for the page. You're particularly well, I, 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 I do always write for the page. You know, which is to say, if you write, it's for the page. You know, there's no way to write. Because you, what are you? You're writing on a page, or now you can write on a screen, which gives, uh, with uh, digital technology, the you know at least an opening into saying, well, I'm not writing for the page. I'm you know, I'm writing for the pixelization of the uh, the, the light implants or whatever. Um, I'm not thinking about how to perform it as I'm doing it, as I'm writing, but I, um, while I am performing, I am thinking about whether these words are working or where can they lead me to. So in a sense, when I'm performing, I continue to write, although in that situation, I'm not writing. I'm in the air, right? So, um, you know, the words get all uh, messed up when you start to integrate orality and, uh, and literature and text. Because uh, we are such textual beasts right now that um, the idea of, you know, when hip hoppers do their poems, they say, I'm going to read for you, even though the poem is not in their hands on a piece of paper, and in some cases may never have been in their hands. It was something that was completely uh, created. Selena Glenn does that. Well, somebody's at the door. Do, do you want to do How that? How do I do it? So you want to get me back on track, or you want me to try um, to go back into it? No, no. I uh, I think I can segue to where I, where I want okay. to be here. I'm good. Okay. So, um, yeah, you were saying that, that even hip hoppers, they say they're reading even if they're performing it. Um, without a paper in front of them. And so what do you consider your particular form of poetry if you have a label for it? Would well, you, uh, you know, of course, you know, here I am in the academy, which is why we need labels, right? We also need labels because there are just so many more people now. We have to figure out things for everybody to do. We need labels because uh, the horrific triumph of capitalism knows that to sell something, it has to have its specific and sexy name so that people are going to want to buy it. You know? um, right now, spoken word has the, uh, has the lead in, in what I do. Um, even though words like spoken word or poetry, performance, are, as my uh, teacher Walter Ong uh, uh, says, retronyms. That is to say, it's the um, renaming of the original according to what we currently uh, see as this entity. He's, his example was a horse is an automobile without wheels. And so when we start talking about performance poetry, we're talking about what originally was poetry filtered through the lens of hundreds of years and only hundreds of years of text uh, till the point where a spoken word is something extraordinary and a, um, uh, a text is considered the poem. And those who don't, and, and for poems not in these books, we then rename the original orator as, as uh, oral literature, you know, something like that. Um, I love all the conflicts because then you get to talk about poetry, which is the next best thing to talking poetry. And that makes me jump a little. We'll probably go back and forth. I was going to go, oh, how did you meet Ken? How did you get introduced to deaf poetry and this and all that? But I'm going to go back to that later since we have, you're talking about this and oral and performance and all that. How does sign language poetry, from your experience of it, relate to everything you're telling me about how it? You know the oral quote, this oral thing going back to it, which was it was before, and then print took over. Can you relate your whole experience of? Are we okay with that uh, heater? I can turn it off. Perfect. I also need to at some point, Mary. I forgot to print out my ASL poem. I don't know if I've done it for you, but I have a poem called uh, something like "If If I Had All the Money." You sign it? Even I don't it? sign it. Oh. it. You can sign it. I'd love somebody in an oval. <laughs> okay. Um, but it is, it's about ASL. Oh, cool. That would, so I'd like cool. to do that. Okay? Yeah. 
Um, well, I have always, uh, from the second I, I, I saw Peter and Kenny, and that was my first uh, taste of uh, ASL poetry, I knew this was part of the scene, part of what's going on now to reclaim poetry's musicality and origins so that it can have a utility in a world where, uh, that is anti-poetic, where poetry has become um, the property of, um, of, of a few small uh, book publishers and uh, where poems are generally written for other practitioners. Uh, where poetry, this is when I was coming up, poetry was generally thought of as something that somebody was going to teach you and it was going to be boring and you were going to have to memorize it and it really was uh, an, an, an antiquity. Uh, now poems are vital in the language of youth and the whole hip hop culture that is uh, so uh, one of the most important movements globally is based on uh, on poets speaking words so it's an amazing it's been a great a great ride in the midst of a really terrifying destruction of our country and uh, and the takeover of corporations across the globe but the poetic economy is still standing up he said sitting down and uh, even in the poetic or gift economy so, you know, I mean, that's what Peter is doing up there. He's giving it away. He's giving it away to everybody, and everybody is very happily receiving it. Uh, and not only that, but they're giving it back. And that's the poetic economy, as opposed to $25 for a ticket to the 92nd Street Y, or um, please give money to your local poetry organization so that they can fund the same thing they were funding 50 years ago. You know, what, whatever. It's a, new, it's a new thing. And that's what it felt to me, a, a, a new thing. That, you know, and the more you think about it, the more the magnificent ironies that poetry insists on um, are fiscalized by the work that the ASL poets are doing, starting with the fact that uh, the best example we have of a, of a poetry in the oral tradition, um, oral tradition being that which is not written down, the, 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 uh, the essential uh, poetry that is oral is ASL poetry, which cannot be written down and therefore is only oral, and yet it's for people who don't speak. So again, you find the language foundering upon itself. Um, and watching uh, Peter's ability to transmute sign into dance, mime, theater, song, um, is to watch the, uh, all of this specifications of arts into these different genres to wash away and to see that what art is, is communication of a godly sort. Communication that is, in this case, whole body communication. And that's another thing that, that ASL does that uh, none of the other poetries uh, can touch. You know, with a poet in the oral tradition like the griots in West Africa, the Jali poets, it's uh, very clear that the poem cannot be separated from the event. Uh, the uh, anthropologists always have a hard time figuring out when the poem begins, but the poem begins when the uh, griots got the Korah tuned up and says, come on in here, we're going to get started, let's go bring everybody in, and the first words are, come on in here, we're going to get started. You know, because as the people come in and the, uh, and, the, and the poet sees who the audience is, the way that that poem is going to be laid out this time becomes uh, clearer uh, to, the, to the historian, artist, uh, keeper of tradition who is the griot in the, in the oral traditions.
So it's a spontaneity of working with the art. They have something possibly planned, or they have a way they're going to go, but it changes according to who's sitting there. With, um, I, mean, I think I'm drawing a kind of comparison between um, the in in the hearing world, how the, in the in the oral tradition, the full event is the poem. Um, you can stretch it even into saying that a slam could be the form of a, of a, a poetry slam where judges are picked out of the audience, the rituals that go along with the slam, that the judges hold up the numbers, that the audience boos the numbers, you know, all of these, this kind of interaction is part of the frame for the poem. You're not there. This is one of the reasons why poetry slams work is that you don't go to hear the poet. You, know, you go to see the slam, to participate in it. You know you're going to hear ten different poets. Who are they? You probably don't know. You know, as opposed to, let's go hear John Ashbery read his latest Pulitzer Prize winning work. You know, that's one thing. Let's go to the Poetry Slam. That's not the one thing. Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's like going to see Rocky Horror Picture Show. And there's a framework that's different every time because of who the audience is. And I think mean, the Rocky Horror Picture Show definitely, you know, is a kind of. Uh, um, a, a kind of orality, you know, the joint, you know, the costuming and this, you know. But, of course, in that case, they're, uh, at least so far as I know, they're not making up the words. You know, they're using the words that are already in the film to bring the film back to life. And uh, talking about how film interacts, hello, with, um, you know, with, with, or, with orality, with poetry is uh, a whole other question. To get that. Well, it would stop it from ringing. When you watch Peter and Kenny, well, I have a couple questions actually. First of all, in terms of what Kenny says, his words, which he sort of considers cueing, he's not an interpreter and never presented himself as an interpreter. His goal is to give as few words and sound effects as possible so that the hearing audience can kind of really focus on Peter, maybe pick up, start to see the signs, not necessarily learn them so they can produce them themselves, but start to learn it as they go so that Kenny can voice less and less. Do you? feel that his words are, uh, do you wish there were more, do you wish there were less, do you, do you kind of, is it like a little voice in your ear that kind of gives you a little bit and helps you along, what's that experience like for you? You know, Kenny and, and Peter are working in a zone all to themselves. No one else that I see has been willing to live with each other for 20 years and figure out what the heck a poem is when it's crossing over between uh, ASL in English. You know, there is no greater uh, uh, educational experience for a hearing person to learn what sign is than by uh, watching flying words. Um, these are both consummate artists who through their play are, are inventively finding out the core of what this uh, language thing is all about. And because of their playfulness, um, both in uh, creativity and also in um, their interaction with the audience, they keep everybody's interest right there. Makes it difficult, maybe, for uh, an academic uh, study or even a documentary about. But um, it certainly is, uh, to me, the way to, to push the information out to the largest possible audience. And I think that what you see in the, uh, in the publication of this recent book, uh, Dirksen and Heidi's book, what's it called? The Body Poetic. The Body Poetic. I think, you s I think you see in The Body Poetic the way that the ASL Academy is much more open to all forms of uh, the poetics in, in that community than the hearing community is. Um, you know, that, uh, um, that Dirksen is, you know, is, is, th is there handing out accolades to, to Kenny and Peter's show that there is, and that's part of ASL, there's no distinction being made between high and low, you know, it doesn't, you know, is it because there aren't enough people to have that? 
or is it because there is inherent in using a whole body uh, language and giving yourself away so totally? Um, is there is, is it uh, is it a, a, a given that we're all in this together? There's a lot, just so much to eat up, you know, in this. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I want to get back though to to uh, to uh, to Kenny. You know, uh, Kenny's work has has evolved extraordinarily over the, over the years, and he does do a lot more. He's he is more willing now to to be on the side and to drop the cues as. Uh, as it said, into the ears of the uh, of the hearing audience. It's uh, you know I, I I I think of it in terms of the way that Edwin Denby uh, used to write his criticism. You know, to my mind, uh, the greatest dance critic that we've ever seen and a poet. Denby would never have a um, a judgmental phrase in any of his criticism. He would simply allow you to see the placement of the dancer's feet and body in such a way that if it were awkward and not working, you'd say, well, that's too bad. It could have been something else. Or if it was, you know, um, you know, sheer elegance beauty, then you would say, ah, after seeing it through these words. And so Kenny does not tell you what to see. He's there in it, putting a word in the, the place of um, it could be the sign, or it could be the movement, or it could be the whole gestalt that, that Peter is at that point. Um, likewise, his ability to, uh, to take the, um, the really, uh, um, the noises that Peter does make, the deaf noises that he makes, and let them uh, evolve into sound effects through his work is a, another way of giving us a way into to, uh, the deaf experience. Um, yeah, I w think that um, the that the intro that that uh, that uh, flying words does at times, where they give you a brief example of what rhymes are in uh, in, in in ASL poetry, what um, cinematic techniques are being used in ASL poetry that are the same as as, say, metaphor or synecdoche in, in, in he hearing poetry is a, a wonderful uh, way. Maybe, maybe that's just because I have in my old age become an academic, but I like it when, when, when that does happen. I think there are little tidbits of, uh, of, uh, of intro are, you know, help bring people along a long ways. And that's Kenny's, also part of Kenny's genius. In, uh, in in doing this, okay. so you know while while now it's m more than ever Peter out front. Although when there is a uh, a duet, it is never anything less than bravura anymore, and you are never seeing anything but the four-handed beast. You know when they're when they're hard at work in their duets. Um, I think it is a much you know that the performance is. Uh, it really has continued to evolve, and is it that uh, you know continues to be has always at the highest point it's ever been, and just pushes itself through play and now through the whole um, um, energy of the the trains having gone so far, you know the, the chug chug puff puff of on we go, that uh, it's taken on this extreme you know this extraordinary life. Have you seen other deaf poets other than Kenny and Peter? Do you have um, any exposures? I was at, you know, I was at um, a the the big conference down at Gallaudet. I was and I was at the conference in in Rochester in the late eighties. Uh, that was or was it the early nineties? You came to the Deaf Lit Conference in ninety one. Ninety one. Mm -hmm. So you know, so I've seen you know that's where I really spent. I guess three days um, in the midst of a, a deaf world without really knowing. I knew Kenny and Peter, but not not, not as well as I do now, and uh, really got to experience. I think the uh, the real deal before there was a real deal. You know. Do you remember? I know that you were also at the Gel House. There was a bridge. 
Bridge Festival. That was the first summer. time I met Kenny and Peter. That's when you first met them. And there were other Deaf Poets there, too, and I don't know if you saw them or not. I just wonder if you have a basis of comparison or you remember enough about anybody else you saw to well, be able to. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, oh, I can't remember names now. You know, that's the thing. But I do... There was a... Uh, the guy whose name begins with B and who is the great progenitor. Bernard Bragg? No. Another. another. Robert Panera, Patrick Grable, an older Maybe gentleman? Maybe it was Patrick Grable. Yeah, older. Baldhead? Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That was Grable? Probably. Yeah. So, um, and then of course I remember people at. Um, at the one in Gallaudet, the great big guy who did the walk through the graveyard piece. Mm. You know, do you remember his name? Sure. Um, I think if you threw names that gave me hints, I could give you some capsule um, uh, descriptions. Um, there is the woman who's worked a lot with film, mm -hmm. whose work I've seen quite a bit of. But you know, um, in my world, uh, you know, ASL poetry is, you know, one of many, many ki kinds of morality that I'm working with that I'm not so familiar because that world is more uh, um, enclosed than the others. And I'm hoping that this book will, uh, will open things up. But there's nobody who opens it up or who has taken on, you know, that risk of, uh, um, you know, it's risky what Peter and King are doing to bring it this far to the hearing audience. On the other hand, when I, you know, the, last night's crowd was primarily deaf and they were having the time of their life and the people who were hearing weren't far behind in having the time of their life. So um, the risk really is worth it. The, you know, what wants to happen now is that it, these poems can open up in other directions and with other poets. Yeah, there were uh, some college slam kids that went right before them. I stayed, I was there at six to watch the slam. It was incredible. And there were three guys that just blew me right out of my seat and I asked them to stay. And I said, if I, you know, if you didn't have to pay to get in, could, would you stay? And I'll interview you afterwards. I'm just, and you don't even have to like it. I just want to know what you think. And because you guys work so much with imagery and metaphor and incredible stuff with words, and if you've never seen this kind of thing, I'd really like your take on it. And they, they really loved it too, and it was great to get their comments afterwards. Well, Miriam, that's really why awesome. you're produced, and that's why you get to be the producer. Mm -hmm. That is a brilliant idea. And of course, the idea that the, uh, you know, the hip hop slam before the ASL Flying Words event uh, could be more than just, uh, you know, touching elbows as you come and go, but could stick around and see. That's why the Bowery Poetry Club is is there. And it was last night that I that I realized that in my next project, which is to work with a, a documentary um, unveiling the poetries of of endangered languages as a uh, as a sense of a, a, a political urgency. Um, to see languages, which to me are simply forms of consciousness, um, as part, as much part of the ecology as endangered plants and animals, begins to uh, get at what uh, what this language of ASL is all about, and of course it is an endangered language as well. Um, wondering if the uh, the uh, cochlear implants are going to have an impact in the in the in the actual population of of uh, those using sign. Um, and be interesting to try to keep track of the numbers. Right now, it's wonderful just to keep track of the art mm -hmm. as much as you can. Did a few um, videos, which is the closest you can come to a book with ASL, with um, with Kenny and Peter. We did, um, for WNYC's Poetry Spots, we did the one about the doggy. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Charlie. Charlie, the Vietnam bomb smith sniffing tunnel dog. Uh, amazing piece. 
And then we did um, for our very first foray into uh, PBS, us being Josh Blum, my partner on these TV shows, and me. Um, we had, and Mark Pellington, the director, had Peter uh, doing uh, You Have Ordered Me to Speak, um, which he did solo on, on, on the, uh, in that show. And then, of course, Peter was the last word in the United States of Poetry, the big uh, award-winning uh, PBS series. Um, it was such a battle there. I mean, Peter wrote a 15-minute poem to, uh, to be included in USOP, and it was uh, the entire United States as told in ASL. Through every poet and, and uh, iconic caricature, Pecos Bill and his old girlfriends are interacting. It's just a wonderful, wonderful piece. And he did it all in one take, which still exists on tape as the hero take, it was called. And it in, we ended up being able to use 20 seconds, the very end. The very last word is given over to ASL. And it was only through, I mean, this was a cutthroat battle amongst us to, uh, but I was not going to do this show if we weren't going to get ASL into it. Likewise, when I, I was a judge over in uh, the Zebra Poetry Festival in Berlin, which is the biggest poetry video festival in the world. And uh, there are five judges and one of the pieces was a really simple heads, it's just straightforward, one camera, one take shot of a, of a deaf poet in German sign language doing a poem and getting so, f the director calls out something to her that clearly has nothing to do with what's going on and she can't really tell what he's saying anyway. And she just rushes past the camera and that's the end of it. Um, up against some really highly produced numbers and some historical pieces that were fantastic. But again, there was a, a feeling I had that there is a, um, if you don't give a, uh, you know, if you don't give voice to deaf poetry when you're, when you're working on films, you, if you don't acknowledge that this is the, the medium that you've got if you're deaf, then, uh, you know, you're, you're missing part of what film and poetry is. So, and it turned out that there was an, I had an ally, which rarely happens on these judging things. And he, like me, agreed that there was such a political exigency in letting this piece be one of the winners that, um, we both, unbeknownst to each other, gave it our number one votes. And if it got two out of five votes, it was automatically going to be one of the one of the three winners. So this piece, the other two pieces were extremely slickly produced and wonderful, evocative, you know, music and the whole nine yards pieces. And here's this raw little one take documentary of a, an ASL poet. Uh, but it, it's step by step to bring awareness of uh, what um, what it means to have the you know in, in a world where you're trying to get people to listen, what it means that you can't hear, and if you start from that point, how poetry it doesn't cut the poetry out. In fact, it makes it all the more necessary. What about the translation? Part? Like when you came to Rochester, I know I interpreted for you at least once and maybe twice. One time when I was out to here with Jamie, I remember. And uh, I don't remember how much time we had to work before with my uh, translations of what I was going to sign for you. But either with me or with other people that you've worked with, what's it like for you to work with interpreters when you've had that experience? Well, first, Miriam, I'd like to say that your uh, translations get better the later the night is and the more alcohol that's consumed. What else it, is you know, that it just <laughs> becomes so organic, the translations. And le le last night's party, 
And that was the first time Pat Russell had ever, you know, sat in with, in a, you know, in a deaf conversation. But your ability to keep the two of us afloat in this uh, world of sign was just, you know, it was it was totally terrific. And yet Pat was so worn out at the end of an hour. You know how do people? You know how the energy that you that you have. Uh, when you're deaf, the energy you have to, to give yourself a way to communicate is, um, you know, the best exercise on the planet. <laughs> Full body exercise. Beyond Pilates. Um, I work with uh, deaf translators the same way I work with all translators in performance, which is that the more you can have interaction with the translator, then the more you try, you, be, you can break down the uh, the artificiality of the formal poem and allow the event itself to uh, to take over. So um, it's j that's I, the very first time that I had a a, a a a a signing translator was at the Bridge Festival. It was that guy named Bob, mm -hmm. and he I brought him a question mark jacket to wear, as I was at that point panic DJ and wore a question mark jacket. Which is why I think that um, um, writers and books, man. Joe Flaherty. Okay. I was wearing a, a uh, question mark jacket, and I brought an extra one for the signing translator, and his name was Bob, too. Joe Flaherty gave me the gig because he knew that I wouldn't just stand there on the stage. And I didn't. As a matter of fact, I taught a few moves to Bob. So he was. We were actually doing a little bit of dance as we, as I was giving my poem uh, through the mic, and he was giving it uh, through his body and signs. So um, it's a, you know, it's a wonderful treat for people, for hearing audience seeing sign for the first time. It's always so devastatingly other to have or and exotic to have these signs and this, this kind of emotion coming at you even it, it's more dramatic than Shakespeare if Shakespeare is behind them this is more dramatic the person in the oval which is something that has to really be worked with thought through and fought through as well you know, um, and and one of the great things that Peter and Kenny have been able to to uh, to do and make fun of, which is always you know eases you up because there ain't no answers to it. Just uh, you know, something is lost in translation. One of the funniest things. I wonder what that is. But something is also gained. Right. Yeah. I. Uh remember working with you that um, one of the things I w would worry about when I was when I was interpreting for a poet is that their words might be beautiful and it's great stuff and I can come up with some really great translations but I never want to be the center of it because the point is even that the deaf people have to look at me to get the information I want actually I'm hoping that the hearing poet is interesting enough and moves enough or has enough charisma that the deaf people and also the hearing people who like to watch sign aren't all focused on me one of the great things about working with you is you're very interesting to watch. So I knew that I wouldn't be stealing. You're certainly not somebody who'd have to worry about my stealing your stage time, because, you know, which is always a worry, because people do say, oh, it's so much more fun to watch the interpreter. I like the poetry, but you know, it brings it alive with the interpreter. I, you know, there was no competition, because yeah, you're I, very dynamic. I, am, uh, I disagree with you, you know, and I would like to allow uh, signers to do whatever they want to do which is what I do when I translate from the Urdu or the Chinese. And though I do know some Chinese, I don't know any Urdu. And I've, yet I've translated a lot from those languages. And when I do, I take it the only way I know how to take it, which is through me. Now, I, maybe if I were a translator first and a poet second, I'd f think differently. But I don't, I don't know. Hard for me to think differently. I'm already thinking differently. Um, but I wish that the uh, signers would go full tilt boogie all the time. Why not be the set? Who cares? You know, if maybe the poet says, "Oh, 
they're all watching. Thank goodness they're watching somebody that's moving and interesting. You know, I don't care what that is. Or, wow, maybe I should do something a little bit more here to get attention focused on me a little bit. You know, I, I'm, to me, it's a, it's a false issue. You know, that uh, ASL carries in it the seeds of all of this. The magnet. You know, the, 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 the energy of uh, performance of the spoken word. So what do you want to do? Hide that? Because you happen to have a poet who doesn't know anything about it? Well, why don't you let them learn about it and why don't you give your audience the best experience, the, the deaf audience the best experience they can? And uh, you know, so I, 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 I'm, I, you know, may, I'm, it's not academically correct, I'm sure. You want to do that, let the, the artist be in the spotlight. But to me, the artist isn't what's in the spotlight. It's the poem that's in the spotlight, right? And a poem isn't written until somebody hears it. If you're deaf, <laughs> you're not going to hear it anyway. So the poem isn't written, and even though it's an ASL poem, isn't ever written. Okay, so there is no poem unless there's somebody else there to see it. And, uh, you know, so it's all up to you, the translator. I don't think anybody holds back, but it's always a worry that we that we're the ones there. Let watching, me you know. just go, <laughs> please translators, signers, go worry about something else now. You worry too much about that. <laughs> um, can you, you? You're hitting everything, which is great. Oh, um, I'm wondering about it's a nebulous term. I'm not sure even I totally understand it. The idea of beat beat poetry, beat influence, what is the beat type of stuff, and that term has been liberally and uh, enthusiastically embraced by Peter and Debbie Rennie, who was a deaf poet also, and a couple other people as, well, we're sort of like, it seems like the beats had a big influence on us, and Allen Ginsberg, of course, and Bukowski, because so, so much imagery, and if you could riff on that a little bit, beat poetry in your own yeah. stuff, beat, okay. beat stuff, yeah, yeah. what you see in, yeah, yeah. in ASL. Yeah. Um, the... Now, what Ginsburg and the Beats did in U.S. was to free poetry from a, a classical mode, push it off into the worlds of, of, of Boheme, the Bohemians. What the Beat poets uh, did was to free the word from the confines of the um, academic traditions uh, and, uh, and open it up both to the worlds of Bohemia and to the event of the poetry reading. You know, think of it. Uh, I mean, Ginsburg's uh, great poem is Howl. There you have it. You can hear it. You know, what uh, I see the deaf poets doing, what, what Peter takes from it, is that spirit of uh, loving rebellion. You know, that. Uh, um, and just as it was Ginsburg fighting uh, for gay rights, uh, fighting against the war in Vietnam, so do the ASL poets in their very life fight for the existence of the deaf community, of uh, a minority whose voice isn't being heard. Um, the, um, the playfulness and beat um, the playfulness of Peter, uh, the picking up of the, the, you know, the five-day-old beard and a beret uh, um, accoutrements, is also just a, a, a way of relaxing into a poem. I don't think that the imagery that the deaf poets use is really what the Beats did. I see it more. I see it uh, more similar to the observation of William Carlos Williams, of course, who was a great teacher to, uh, to, to, uh, to Ginsburg, but you know, he, he had very short lines that were very descriptive and, and acute, and that's what uh, it seems to me that most, that, 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 that is, uh, that's common among um, ASL poets is that by having the image be transmuted into a sign, that they're focusing on 
these certain objects, which then take on a rhyme and, quote, literary life of their own. Um, all of this being much different from the long lines wildness of, uh, of, uh, of Ginsburg and, and Corso. If I'm, I'm concerned about your time. It's five to two, and you've hit on just about everything I want to ask, unless there's anything else you feel like you want to I want to read the poem. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Action. Okay, this is uh, If I Were to Throw My Money. If I were to throw all my money into anything, I'd throw my money into the deaf community. If I were to throw all my money anywhere, I'd throw it into ASL. Because the future of the species is immune to all the preaching. And the silence of these moments is best spoken to by the quietude of far by few. Oh, in the silence, you hear the heart drum. You hear the ear pull air towards hair. But in the gesture of the measure of the pasture, you are for sure ASL will lead you past the pasture to the gate where you will hear. So take my money, take my tongue, take my breath and see it fly. Listen to the deaf community. Listen to the poetry, the whir of meaning coming up for air. Walk together to the riverside, making small talk sign by sign. The body's speaking now, hush, listen with ecstatic eyes. Wow, that's great. Can I have that? You can have that. Can you sign it? I'll sign it, but I don't know how to sign. Well, <laughs> did I walk into that or what? Did I just say, here, take me universe and mock me? <laughs> should have done that for the intro last night. Awesome. It went well last night. I thought it was a lot of fun. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. All you have to do is go down the elevator and you're all set. Everything locks behind you. Um, yeah, you, can, you know, don't worry about it. Okay, I mean, it's too much to teach, you know, so, and it's not that long, so I'll use you see it. I need your name first, please, and what what you do. Uh, my name is Stefa. Uh, last name is Abuduka, and I'm a dancer and a choreographer. Okay. And how long have you been a dancer? I have been dancing, oh goodness, for over 30 years. Well, you know, I might have been dancing, you know, as a little girl, but I didn't know I was dancing, but I think I was. <laughs> how did you get involved in the whole deaf thing from the beginning, if you don't mind? Well, through dance. Okay. Um, I, uh, I had just graduated and got my master's in uh, dance, and I was applying for jobs all over the country and sent them all out all over. And came, you know, rejections were coming back and thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't know where this is all going to end up. And then I got a phone call from NTID, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, and they said they wanted to interview me. And I was like, whoa. Okay, it's happening. And uh, so they flew me out, and I was interviewed. And I was interviewed by Patrick Grable and members of the theater department. And uh, that was my first moments into um, the world of the deaf. 
and the beginning of friendships that have lasted a lifetime. Did you pick up sign right away, take classes? No, no, I, I had no knowledge of sign language at all. Um, I, very little experience in, um, in deaf culture. Uh, however, when I went to high school, uh, there was an old Victorian building that was right across the highway, and you could see it from our high school, and it was uh, St. Joseph's School for the Deaf. And periodically, we would go over there and do things. So it, it, it was something that is sort of a, uh, a vague memory, but it came back to me that I did have that experience in high school. So, but no, when I fell into NTID, I fell into a new world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how did you pick up sign as you were, you were teaching deaf students and yet you were starting out without having any sign skills? Exactly. Well, what was, how'd that go? What was it that like That was scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you could imagine, I was placed into a situation where um, uh, in three months I would be, actually it was shorter than that, I, came, I arrived in July and I, by September I would have deaf students in front of me. And um, but I had a wonderful, wonderful deaf teacher. Uh, you all remember Sam? Sam Holcomb, I believe. Anyway, he was my first deaf teacher, and um, he was wonderful. And he just made learning um, real. But my true teachers were people like um, Peter Cook and Kenny Lerner and Debbie Rennie and Patrick Rabel. Uh, I learned from friends. Uh, they taught me something that you don't learn in a book and you don't learn in, in a classroom. Um, they taught me that the goal was communicating and reaching out to another human being that was creative and expressive. And I arrived at sign language with that. Uh, that's my initiation into sign language, is to be creative and expressive and to communicate and to do everything you can to get your point across be because it's another person and you, you're reaching out to them. That's the point. And uh, I'm grateful for that. What year was that? Ooh, I do remember, 1984, 1984. So one of the things that a lot of people have mentioned is that your dance, your, the, the, the uh, improv classes that you did at your loft and other things, I guess, that were more form, form, formal excuse me, at NTID really had a big impact on their work. So there's a few questions I want to ask related to that. And one is you have these deaf people in front of you and you're teaching them dance and you're learning sign. And I imagine that you really saw the movement of sign is quite a compelling thing as a dancer because there's so many movements that are dance-like and whatever. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about like just what that whole thing, you're learning sign at the mm -hmm. same time, you're teaching the deaf and you're teaching them movement, which they already move, but they're learning a different way of movement. Just riff on that whole thing if you don't mind. I fell in love with sign language. I just fell in love with it. Um, <laughs> I remember thinking to myself that for the first time in my life, I realized just how communicative movement can be. When I experienced sign language, I didn't know ASL from Sign Exact English or Sign English or you know, any of the varieties of, of languages. Um, I saw movement and I was more than compelled. I was in love with it. And anyone who would come up to me and use sign language, <laughs> they were giving me a gift. And I was totally, in, in, I, and I embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, to this day. I love sign language. I tell people it's one of the most beautiful languages in the world. Did you find that you choreographed differently for deaf students you were working with than had you than hearing people that you'd worked with before? Was there anything about just the nature of signing or that they were deaf that made you incorporate different sorts of movements into your work? I don't think I actually changed how I work with them. I think what happened, it was like you added to the recipe a very particular spice, very particular herbs, that what, what the language was bringing to my work was more of, uh, it gave it richer, it made it richer, it gave it an essence of flavors I had never tried before. So in that sense, sign language did influence me. But as far as working with individuals who were deaf or hard of hearing, I, I just came from a, my own authentic source. And I just hope that when I was working with them, I was able to communicate what, what I thought I could get from them, what I could reach in and pull out. And if sign language would help me get that, then I was hungry to learn the language in order to get to that. So it was not so much that, oh, I've got to learn sign language and I better learn it quickly. It was more like, whoa, how do I get that individual person 
to come to this place that I know about and that I really want them to get there. How do I let them know and trust me enough that I can take them there? And these wonderful people, uh, students and colleagues and friends, they let me do it. You know, they, they, they showed me the way, and, and I think that's why it worked. Did you go to any of the performances that were happening around that time? Like there was the cellar where there was a lot of deaf, first there were some Def Jam things happening at some parties that have been called that heavy maze that Peter and Dennis Webster and some other folks were doing, Mike Hansen. Then they went into the cellar and they did more public sort of things. Were you part of that scene or did you go to any of that stuff? Is Jazz Berry's part of that scene? That was a little <laughs> bit later. That was a little bit later. I, I, that that I, too, I'd yeah. like to know about that too. I think I arrived like in the Jazz Berry era. You know, we'd all go and get food and then just go watch our friends express and be artists. You know, it was interesting. Um, when I was at NTID, I had students and then I had friends. And sometimes I would approach my friends, even though they were my students, they were also my friends because I understood their creativity and I respected the level of their creativity. And I really wanted them to, um, to know that I was meeting them on equal ground. What they knew and what they were offering me I had hoped that I would reciprocate through my dance and through the artistry that I uh, um, have been passionate about.
what was the surprise was that my passion was increased by their passion. And those two worlds met. So, um, yeah, that's what happened back there. <laughs> In Rochester, New York. Rochester, it's yeah. amazing. It was like the, the nexus of it. Um, Peter and Debbie specifically have said that your, your, the movement sort of things that you work with them with in dance really affected their work. And I wonder when you watch like the DVD that I sent you mm -hmm. and other things that you might remember from that time, can you look at their stuff and go, oh, I, you know, I can see how I have this a little bit of influence. And you don't have to worry about being <laughs> egocentric or anything about saying it, but you could maybe know, have you noticed any sort of movements or any sort of ways that they work that would show that you had a little bit of, a, of an indelible stamp on them? Well, you know, Miriam, something did occur by my lack of knowledge of sign language and by my sort of innocence in that realm. I would bring my full body expression to it. And they would show me an exact sign and say, oh, no, this is how you sign it, and be like, oh, now I know. But then when I'd go and, and, and use it to communicate to them, I would add something about me and my movement. And I always called it a kind of poetic license. And so... Um, I'd be talking to them about movement and not only be adding my own physicality to it, yeah, but I would be adding a concept of time and space. And, and it's true in, in poetry, too, that there's, there's a place between the words and a place between the movement, and that's the place I always want to go to creatively. And that's the space that continues to intrigue me till this day. And when I'm using movement, um, it, it's just a part of my body. I just carry it. And so when I bring it to the language, to an exact word, sometimes I stretch it. You know, I, I, I let it be more fluid. I, I create a word. I mold it. I sculpt it. And I think they were responding to that. And they weren't correcting me. They weren't saying, oh, by the way, you're in a frame and you should work within the frame. Or, or, oh, you're not supposed to spin when you say that word. Or, you know what I mean? So um, they let me bring my, my gift to the language. And I found later, when I left Rochester and, and came to New York, that I was around people that were looking at sign language from a more exact format. And, and I realized how much poetic license I had taken and how much they let me bring myself to the language. And that, I think, made the choreography cross both worlds. It was not only a dance world, it was not only a world of, of poetry, which, by the way, I view all dance as poetry. I try to find the poetry in absolutely everything. And I, I, I believe it is in absolutely everything. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that exactly answered your question. In, in a roundabout way, um, yeah. so when I looked at like Missing Children, that Debbie and Kenny wrote together, and I think that was on the DVD. And she has a lot of dance sort of movements in that, as well as some cinematic techniques, some slow motion and some other things. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I, I have an interview with her, and she does talk about having some dance background, but the, the bulk of her dance influence was you. Mm -hmm. And I see her movement and her stuff is, but I, this won't be on the tape, but I haven't seen a lot of your work yet, because I have <laughs> to find the tapes that people will give the damn things to me of that <laughs> time period, and then maybe I'll see it. I'm hoping to cut things because I think we'll see some influences, and if I can find those old performances too, I think we can juxtapose them and show that even more clearly. Mm -hmm. But I just wondered if you, when you watch that, if you go, yep, that was a little thing that I used to do, or that's the thing that I kind of was trying to get my students to do more of. Or yeah, I, I think I, I gave them the license to use their whole body. Um, not that I had to tell Peter and Debbie to use their whole body, or, or Dennis Webster, or any of them. What, what, I, what I did was I said, that's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. that's, that's awesome. And what if? And then I'd show them the what if. You know? And particularly when they worked in my art and my choreography, I, I would ask them to go a little bit beyond what perceived boundaries were in the movement and perceived boundaries in the language. So we could take it to another place. And, and I think that that's when it worked most for me. And continues in a choreographic sense to work for. I use a lot of gesture. And um, I, I think that when you carry language that is trying to communicate something and you're using gesture, and you also have a dance background, uh, a formal dance background, and, and you're passionate about all these things, when you get the final culmination of all that, it is a, it's, it's a new thing. 
It's a fresh and new thing. And it's very precious. And I think that if you take that to your poetry, um, you know, the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Truly. Did you use um, any uh, other genres in your work, like I'm thinking of cinematic techniques, the things that are strong elements in ASL poetry? Did you? Were any of those sorts of things incorporated into your dance or choreography? Did you slow motion or cinematic things or angles, anything like that? I, uh, through my dance background, of course, slow motion is, you know, just, you know, exquisite. Um, as far as the technology of using any of the genres, uh, technologies, I, I didn't have that knowledge. Um, I came into NTID, you know, a dancer. Um, uh, a young girl who wrote poetry and read lots of poetry. I was an English major in college, and I, uh, uh, one of my dreams was to be a poet. And the beauty of dance was that it is poetry. And I, I continue to see dancing as a form of poetry when it comes from a deep and authentic place. So it's, it's not that you mirror someone else's work or you try to be a part of a particular um, timely evident or uh, event. It's when something deep inside you is coming out, and it's coming out in, in, in the truth. And, and at that point, the language, the movement is one, mm -hmm. is one. Did you incorporate signs into, the, you say you use a lot of gesture now, but at this time when you were learning, did you put actual signs in the dances themselves, yeah. Yeah. and so were the linguistics of the signs something that you were, was it how the sign looked that would match the movement, or were you looking at the meaning of the sign to reflect the movement, or the movement to reflect the meaning of the sign? You know what I'm getting it's, at? Yeah, it's a really good question, and, and, and the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, I remember doing some work with Debbie Rennie, and we were doing a, a piece called Gifts, and what we know of Gifts, and you know, Deb, Debbie is such an intuitive mover. Um, and just a brilliant mind in her own right. And, you know, here I had this incredible tool to work with, you know, a human being, but nonetheless, she was mine, you know. And I, you know, she, I, would, I would bring the sign language to the, um, to the movement, and then I would do permutations on that. So if you have a gift, and then you offer that gift to someone, um, there's something between the someone and yourself that the language is, is going through that passage. And that's when the gift is like, and you can work with your slow motion. Or you can take it from something not quite an exact, but there's a giving and a sharing and expressing. And you go past the point in between. And it's that middle place, that, that space, that's the infinite. And that's what I think poetry goes to, and what dance go to. And it's like, we have a word here, and a word here, and again, it's that space in between. And you use everything, you know, your whole physicality, your whole mental, your whole spiritual, your whole intuitive. You take everything, you put it in that space. And that's the hot spot, that's the lava. That's the place where things happen. And so when I would communicate to something to, like, to Debbie about gifts, I keep trying to go to that place. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, uh, the tour all over the place is directed to sing Washington. Maybe I'll ask you two to mention that next. So. Well, we say, this is a funny aside. And, and I could really get into the fact that they were using sign language in a poetic license kind of way. What I did realize was I was picking up sign language from them. They were my teachers. And so perhaps I was teaching uh, movement. I was using a great deal of discipline, a great deal of um, uh, technique. I mean, I was exposing them to the nuts and bolts of dance, um, not only from my passionate side, but also from my master teachers. Um, I, I'm a, I come from a legacy of powerful people, dancers who knew their stuff. And they were... Um, extraordinarily generous with their knowledge. And I w it was all given to me. And, and now they were behind me, and I had these young people in front of me, and so I was definitely sharing something to them. But what they were sharing back was this whole um, beautiful world of spontaneous movement, language, and 
you know, it was just very rich. And I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and the coffee's ready. <laughs> 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 You keep going and they'll get the coffee. Go get your coffee. Um, what were uh, your teachers' names, if you'd like to mention, if you want to honor oh, some of your teachers? goodness gracious. I, I had so many of them, and I'm going to hesitate because I'd hate to leave one out. Okay, never mind. But I will say that um, my journey in dance started in an improv class in New York City, and it was with a teacher named Norma Dula. And she was a pretty powerful lady, a very, very creative, an artist. And she saw something in me that I didn't see. And she kept me at it. And when she got a job at the University of New Mexico, uh, that was my journey to dance uh, in, in a serious way. Up until that point, I was still planning on writing for the New York Times. <laughs> and um, writing. I was keeping journals regularly and uh, just going to poetry readings and living a world of literature and, and the art and the poems. And um, dance came in, and I fell deeply in love with dance. Yeah. Mm. Did you, um, you are teaching dance now to kids, to deaf kids. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, um, what do you see in your dance that's influencing them? Like, what are, how are you working with them? Are you working with them in a different way than the college students that you used to work with? And uh, why teach deaf kids? Why are you doing this? Well, I, I think the, the question should be, why not? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why teach anyone? Um, I, I believe if you have a gift, you should share it. Uh, you don't know where your path is, where you're going to end up. You know, I had no idea when I was getting my master's at Mills College that I would end up in Rochester, New York, teaching at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Um, I do know that when I arrived and began to be a part of it, I realized I was quite comfortable. So it sort of tells you that you, you arrived, you know, that we don't know what's in front of us, but when we get there, it, there's a feeling of having arrived. And again, I will, I will say that these friends and colleagues treated me that way, as if you've arrived, you know, welcome into the family. Uh, and that was um, wonderful, really wonderful. With children, it's interesting. When I was teaching college-age young people, they were telling me about their horror stories and their dreams and hopes when they were children. And I kept thinking, goodness gracious, we have to go back to the young deaf children and change what I'm hearing so that they can uh, grow up with a, a, a more personal sense of safety, a more uh, um, a righteous sense of, uh, I am present in this culture. I, I am here and uh, knock, knock. You know, I'm here and I'm going to make a difference. We need to get those young children to grow up and become the kind of talents like a Peter Cook, like a Debbie Rennie, like a, a Patrick Grable. And when suddenly I arrived in Brooklyn, New York, and I was in that position, I, I did a little, you know, I look back and realized I had thought that to myself, that we need to make that difference. So I told myself that um, I would try to make that difference on one-to-one -one on each of these students. Uh, I would try to become what I was hoping would exist. Uh, that's, you know, have I been successful? I don't know. I do know that several of my students came to the reading last night, and they were totally involved. And one of my students, Armando, came up, and he said he's going to try. You know, he's going to try to get involved more with performing and poetry and writing. And I looked at him, and I said, you have the sensitive heart for that. You have the soul, the spirit. Don't stop do that. So, you know, they say if you reach one person. So, I don't know if that answers your question per se, but it's not that I changed my teaching because they were children and deaf children. It's that I had to bring everything I knew from my NTID experience and the experience that these individuals so graciously gave me. I had to bring that all back to the next generation. And that I happened to have been the um, uh, the transfer point, you know, I'm, the ca I'm like the catalyst, and yeah, I'll keep trying. <laughs> yeah. Do you see, um, no, no one knows that, I'm speaking about signs and dance with the kids and everything, but that's tangential. Um, that's basically what I need, unless there's anything else you'd like to address, anything more? I think about that you me? should ask her two things. One, I think you should ask her what she remembers from jazz. <laughs> <laughs> good idea, good idea, and other 
coming out, so we can just do it. Just me, Debbie, and Steph are working together, you know, just what was that? And oh, Dorothy, and, uh, the whole thing with Dorothy, Wait remember that? What's yeah. the name of that piece, Steph? Of the, the one uh, we took to New York. Oh, Place Settings? Yeah. Place Settings. that was really, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's so many places we can go with this. Miriam, feel free to, I mean, Kenny, you're right. I mean, there's a the whole... The time is limited, That's but the I just thing. think that jazz varies, and when we came to New York City, I think that that was really a special thing. What's the time thing that you told me about, Pulse, uh, the piece that I keep asking you about? Place it. No. no, 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 no. The other one. Um, the other... Uh, Punctuate Delivery. That one. Oh, yeah. yeah. that was performed, that was a collaboration with my husband, David Fritz, and uh, Kat Ashworth, videographer, and... Um, Jim, I wanted Jim to know music. Uh, there was quite a few individuals yeah, involved in that. In huh? Not no, in punctuate equilibrium. Oh, that was Dennis, Dennis. Dennis Webster. That, oh, Dennis Webster was in that. That was just you, Dennis. And I, yeah, yeah. In, per, in performing cat, and we. Uh, um, that was first performed at NTID. And then later, uh, we performed it at the Pyramid Arts Center in Rochester. We were never able to take it to New York City. But it was on cable, so some people perhaps see, have seen it on cable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, during that same period, uh, Dave and I would sort of do chill down time. You know, we, it was interesting. We were dancing all day and dancing all night. And uh, one of the things we would do to sort of just hang out and chill is go to each other's homes and um, continue to be creative, wild maniacs, and just, you know, again, the sky's the limit in terms of how we played together and uh, created together. Uh, and then in a more formal way, uh, they told us about these poetry readings that would be um, in downtown Rochester, which was uh, at, at a restaurant, and it was called Jazzberries, and it had great food, and people would go there, and we'd just chow down, and then afterwards, there would be these readings. And Dave and I would go there, and uh, these wonderful friends and poets, uh, uh, deaf poets, would do their thing. And I'd just sit back and be in seventh heaven because there it was, you know. And I would watch their, their art and their passion. And um, that was very inspiring. Did you ever go to any of the readings that were hearing people with interpretive performances that were, pre that were rehearsed, like heavy-duty translated interpretive performance of hearing poets as well? the Painted Rope series that Jim Cohen had going, anything like that? I, my experience might have been through Jim Cohen, maybe hearing some of his poetry through him. Okay. I, the truth was is I was so involved in that, that circle that I was in that I didn't have enough opportunities to explore. Uh, there was Writers and Books, I think, in Rochester. There was a place called Writers and Books. and I, I didn't get a chance. There was always a little tap on my shoulder saying, that's there, that's there. But I was so involved in, in, in the circle that I was in, so I didn't get an opportunity to explore that. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that's another passage in my life. Um, it was enough to do exactly what I was to do. What about your improv group? I did want to ask you that. Um, well, I got into dance through improv. Um, that's that's, <coughs> that's how, what I thought th dance was, was improvisation and just letting your whole being express. And so I brought that into the community, and people would be like, oh, I've never danced before. I said, well, when I first did improv, I never danced before. So come on. <laughs> and so Dave and I had a loft in downtown Rochester. Uh, I think it was on St. Paul's. And we had, on Friday nights, open improv. And it was, people were coming in from every direction, deaf, hearing, artists, technicians, writers, musicians, videographers. We were a wild group of creative people. It was rich. It was fun and passionate and um, friendships, deep friendships evolved out of that. Uh, you know, you work with someone at such a level, you can't help but bond with them. Yeah, there's that rich bonding that happens. And uh, so that was the gift of the era. Cool. Yeah. And is that from the improv group? Is that what spawned? It was you one of the many. Kenny and Debbie doing well, we had many piece that you speaking of? Yeah, we had many branches. So uh, the improv groups at, 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 in the loft was one aspect of it. Uh, we had the, um, the choreographic projects that we all did. Uh, one was place settings that uh, Kenny Lerner and Debbie Rennie um, uh, uh, were involved in, and uh, David Fritz. And we took that to New York City to Dance Theater Workshop. Uh, and a wonderful, wonderful time performing that in New York City. It was my own work, so I'll let someone else talk about its success, but a real joy to work on. 
a real joy to work on. And it's an evolutionary piece because I did it years ago when I was a graduate student uh, with a colleague at that time, a dancer, who, her name is Susan Galligan, and she also had worked with the dead. And her, her experience in place settings was then replaced by Debbie Rennie years later. And it was about a couple in their aging process, from young love to um, the ties that bond in your early years, and then in your middle years, and then in your older years, where you begin new ties, and you separate the old ties and add new ones, and you do permutations on your relationship until old age, and then the passing and the separateness of that, of that um, journey. And uh, I must say that Debbie was exquisite. And what she brought to that piece was a, a, a very um, exact and full understanding of, of aging. She was able, through her mind, through her skills as a poet, through her skills as an actress, she was able to age before our very eyes that when she portrayed someone in their 80s, she was in her young 20s. It, it, it took my breath away. And it, it's an, it will always last in my memory that she was able to transform her body and do the movement. And it, it, it was real. She made it real. It's a gift that she had and that we had, I had the pleasure to work with. And of course, David and his wild abandonment, he, he just complimented it. And he's a running theme. He did it when Susan Galligan was his partner. He did it when various other people were his partner. And when Debbie was his partner, they had great chemistry. Wouldn't you say so, Kenny? Oh, awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome chemistry. Is there any document in this? There's no film in this. There may be a document. I, I'm not sure it still exists. I'd have to, I'd have to search it out. Let's we'll see if we can find there it. There might be one of the earliest side performances in New York in Erica. Um, Debbie, Debbie, is called Chocolate. I read Chocolate. Ah, Chocolate. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that, that chemistry worked real well. The, the thing I have to say is through the entire process, I, I found the chemistry with the individuals involved was always perfection. Really, really fine, really fine stuff. So, I've been a lucky woman. Mm -hmm. I have one question for you. Way back when, <coughs> this is about me, so you can turn off your camera. Kenny, I'm sorry, we don't have time. Unless okay, if, if it relates, fine. It relates, okay, I just want to know because of the future. Cool. Okay, okay, fine. You said we were talking about Peter and me and Debbie because we were living together, and you compared me with someone from a long time ago, Art Scene. And I was not aware of that time period. Do you remember? You was it a professional know? individual? It was a professional person who was working with other people like I was. And, and I made a comparison between you. Caught, you, you don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. I'm okay. sorry to say. Okay. I was just curious if you could find But that. yeah, I'm sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. I wanted to, to know. David, do you have a memory of any of that? I'll think about it. Sure. We'll, give, we'll give it some thought. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. I, I think I just want to say one more thing, yeah, yeah. if I may. Um, you want to stop it? Just some noise. Oh, okay. Thank you. I thought we were. Thank you. One second, one second, and go. It's great that uh, at this point in my life that I still have access to those friendships and, and the bonds that, that we created, and that the artistry, uh, the personal effort and passions of each of the individuals is continuing, that each of us are bringing to our lives uh, the length of that, that it wasn't a short-lived moment in time that's gone but that it, it has an evolution and that it's continuing to grow and, pros and, and, and prosper. And, and, and I think that um, seeing the work of like Peter Cook and, De and Kenny Lerner and, and seeing how it's developed and how it's growing and, and the place that they are now, um, that's real special and, 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 and poignant. And uh, I'm so, so happy to see that it's continued. I'm really glad for it. I'm just going to scan and make sure I haven't ever looked, haven't ever looked anything that we've got we covered basically. Set up the paper. What? I'm not finding the paper, but I have it. There it is. Okay. Hey, okay. you. 
Did you meet, you met all three of them, just the, I just want to make sure I've got this. You met Peter, you met Debbie, you met Kenny, you met Patrick, all through the dance department. You hadn't met them anyplace else before. You met them as your entree into that world. They were some of the first. Yeah, people. a Petri dish was NTID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all sort of like dropped in. I mean, well, Patrick was there. He was faculty there. And, uh, you know, Patrick, Patrick is so expressive. So, I mean, I I'm in awe of his artistry. And um, I really hope I get to see him sometime in the future. Uh, Patrick's fingers, uh, they just like reached out, you know? And he, he used that time and space with his hands in a way I've never seen anyone do it. Uh, he, would, he would express something and use the language and his fingers would just like lengthen. And, and, and then the essence of his poet was running through his fingers. I mean, he was just a total physical being with his poetry. Um, and then he was my colleague. You know, I'd see him every day. He's like, hey, Patrick, how are you? What's up? You know, and he'd teach me, and they all teach me. So, yeah, the Petri dish was NTID for me. Beautiful. Thank you. You're That's welcome. great. There's so much in it. There's a lot of I, uh, great little pearls there. I appreciate that I'm involved. <laughs>